Welcome back. In this section, we'll be talking about and graphing linear equations. When we talk about a linear equation, that's one where the highest power for any variable is 1. So if we're thinking about something that's a linear equation in two variables, you'll have y's and you'll have x's, but there'll be no y squareds, there'll be no x squareds, and no higher powers as well. Now, if we're talking about a, a linear equation that's a non-vertical line, then the equation can be written in this form, y equals mx plus b. We'll see that there is one special case, a linear equation for a vertical line that has a different form, but for any other linear equation with two variables, you will be able to write it in that form. And every linear equation for two variables is has a graph that is a, a straight line. Now, we'll have remembered, hopefully from days gone by, that for any straight line, provided it's a non-vertical line, we can describe that line using its slope, using a measurement of how is this line trending? Is it heading upwards? Is it heading downwards? Is it a horizontal line? All of that can be measured with our slope, and our slope is measured by looking at the change in the y values divided by the change in the x values. If you're looking at the little notation that I have here, the triangle uh, that I have is not actually a triangle. This is the Greek letter delta. When we see that shape triangle y, we would actually read that as delta y, or the change in y. In mathematics, when we see that little shape in front of a variable, that's used to refer to the change in something. How does that variable change? And so what we'll do for any two points that happen to be on the line, we can find our slope by just measuring what is the difference in the y values divided by what is the difference in the x values. For vertical lines, there is no slope. The slope is undefined, and that's probably not a big surprise here, because if you're imagining a vertical line, that vertical line would have exactly the same x-coordinate for any points that are on it, which means that when you're calculating what would be the change in the x-values, the change would be zero. You would have something that would be some number divided by zero, and we of course know that that's undefined. So for anything that's not a vertical line, so any other kind of straight line, we will be able to calculate our slope. Now, the meaning of our slope, as I said, it tells us how the line is trending, if the line is increasing or decreasing or horizontal or constant. If we're thinking about what a positive slope would mean, a positive slope tells us that as we go to the right, the line is trending upwards, that we are heading upwards and to the right. If we have a negative slope, then as we go to the right, the line is trending downward. So as we go to the right, we are heading down, we are decreasing. And of course, if you've got a constant slope of zero, then that means that you're neither going up nor going down, you're just heading straight across horizontally. Now, you can also say one further thing about it. Since the slope is the change in the y values divided by the change in the x values, you can interpret this as how do we change in our y direction as we increase our x direction by this much. So we could think of this as a ratio. How much do we go up or down as we go this many units to the right? So for something like this, a slope of negative three-fifths, you could say if you go five units to the right, then the y values will decrease by three. In other words, if you go five units to the right, then you'll go down by three. So let's start with a little example here. We want to find the slope of the line passing through these two points. And so to calculate the slope, that is the change in the y values divided by the change in the x values. And when I do my difference, 
of the y values and the difference of the x values, it doesn't really matter who is the first point and who is the second. So I could think of these two points as x1, y1, and x2, y2. Or I could think of these two points as being the points x2, y2, and x1, y1. And it really doesn't matter. Either way should give me exactly the same slope. So the way that I'm going to be doing my calculations, I'm going to have thinking of these as x1 and y1, and the second point as being x2 and y2. So when I calculate my difference, I have this y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And then we just have to be a little bit careful here not to lose any negatives along the way. The numerator, we've got negative 6. In the denominator, 1 minus negative 3, that's 4. So we've got negative 6 fourths, which is the same thing as negative 3 halves. So if we wanted to interpret this, the line that passes through those points, for every 2 units we go to the right, we'll be going 3 units downward. So this would be a line that's a, a decreasing line, one that's going down and to the right. We've got three different forms for a linear equation, and they all have different purposes or different uses. Uh, the first one is general form, which some books would call this standard form. And this would be the form where we've got our variables on one side of the equation and our constant on the other. And ideally, if we can make those constants and coefficients all integers, that's the ideal. Uh, this is usually how we would write our final answer. This is not the form of the equation that we would probably want to use when we're graphing. And it's also certainly not the form that we use when we're creating our equation of our line. The A, the B, and the C here don't really tell us anything about what the graph looks like in the same way that the other forms of the line all tell us something about how the graph appears. The second form that we have here is the slope point form, which is maybe not super useful for graphing, but is useful for creating the equation of a line. Because for this, to create the equation of a line in slope point form, just like the name says, you need to know the slope and you need to know a point. And it's any point on the line. So if you happen to know a point on the line of, uh, that you're interested in finding the equation of, and if you happen to know the slope, then you can use this form, and then from that form you can simplify it and turn it into general form if you'd like. The last form, which is also useful, is slope-intercept form. This is the form y equals mx plus b, where the m in this case is our slope, as always, and the b, that is the y-coordinate for the y-intercept. So we would know if you had your equation of your line written in this form, slope-intercept form, then you would know what the y-intercept would be, and you would also know what the slope is, which means you're well positioned to create the equation, or create the graph of that equation. So this is not usually the form that I use when I come up with my equation of a graph, but it certainly is one that I'll use when I do some graphing. Okay, so let's start with this, coming up with the equation of a line that passes through these two points. So I'm already thinking ahead that my plan is that I'm going to use slope point form later on to come up with the equation of my line. And the reason I'm going to use that is because I've got some points, and slope point form requires you to have at least one point. And as far as the slope part, because we have these two points, I could use them to find what the slope is for that line. So I'll do that first. The slope is the change in the y values over the change in the x values, which would be 4 minus 1 over 3 minus negative 2, which is the same thing as 3 fifths. So I've got my slope. 
3 fifths, and I can use either of these two points. This is the nice part about slope point form, is that there's no preference as to which of these two points you would have to use. You should probably think using convenience, uh, maybe using the points with the nicer numbers. So if one of those points happened to have nice, simple, small numbers in them, and the other one had terrible decimal numbers in it, you probably want to go with the point that has the nicer looking numbers. For this, it doesn't really make much of a difference. They both seem to be equally nice. So I'm going to use my slope of three fifths and I'm going to use the point negative two one to come up with the equation of my line. So we have y minus the y coordinate equals slope times x minus the x coordinate, which just to simplify that, that's three fifths times x plus two. And one thing that I'm going to do just to make my life easier is to simplify my left side and right side by clearing out that fraction, that three-fifths. I know eventually I'm going to be putting this in general form, which means having x's and y's on one side and constants on the other. And if I could write everything only using integers, that's ideal. So I'm going to sort of make an easier way to get to there by taking the left side and the right side of the equation and multiplying them both by 5. So that on the left side of the equation, I'd have 5 times y minus 1, and on the right side, 5 times that 3 fifths times x plus 2. And that means that on the right side, the 5 and the fifths, they've canceled each other out nicely. So we would have 5y minus 5 on the left side, and we would have 3x plus 6 on the right side. And so now I can write this in general form just by bringing x's and y's to one side and constants to the other. So I would have negative 3x plus 5y equals to 11. This also could be written if you multiplied left side and right side of the equation by negative 1. You could rewrite it as 3x minus 5y equals negative 11. Um, both of those are equivalently nice. I'm mentioning this because some books tend to prefer in their solutions not to start a line with a negative. So for a lot of textbooks in future, if you're looking at the equation of some line or some other function, uh, they probably might prefer to write it in this form, starting with a positive value rather than a negative one. But there's no real preference here for me. I think they're both equivalently nice. One other thing to mention before we move on is that, of course, you can check to see whether your work is correct or not because you know that both of these points should be on this line, which means that both of these points should satisfy this equation. So you could check to see, does negative 2, 1, does it satisfy that equation? Does 3, 4, does it satisfy that equation? And it should. If it turns out that they don't, then that would be a sign that you made a mistake somewhere along the way coming up with your equation. So let's move on and talk a little bit about graphing. I, I had mentioned in the previous section that I've got some expectations as to what I want to see when I ask you to graph something. And so in general, what I'm looking for is a well-labeled graph one where the x and the y axes, you've labeled them, you've got tick marks that are labeled on the x and the y axis, you've got any points that you've plotted, you've labeled them with their coordinates, you've also labeled the graph with its equation. So if you were to, for example, graph y equals x squared and your graph just looks a little something like this, and you say, that's my graph, I'd say, that's probably not the most well-labeled thing I've seen because you haven't labeled the x-axis or the y-axis. I have no idea what sort of scale you're using for x values or y values because you never labeled anything. Even just putting tick marks is not enough because how do I know that this is 1, 2, 3, and 4? How do I know that it's not 
two, four, six, and eight. This is why tick marks are not just to be drawn on, but they also need to be labeled so that I know what exactly are those values that I have along my x-axis and also along the y-axis. You'll be plotting some important points and it's important for you to label those points. So for example, if you just had a point here on the graph and you didn't label it, then I'd have to guess what the coordinate was for that point. It looks like it might be 1, 1, but potentially it could be 1, 1 half or something else. And if you don't label it with its coordinates, there's no way for me to know. So if you were to graph y equals x squared, I would want to see something where, in addition to the shape of the graph itself, if you've labeled any points, I would want to see those points labeled with their coordinates. But I would also want to see the tick marks on the x and the y axis. I would want to see them labeled as well. I would also want to see the x axis and the y axis itself labeled. And I would want to see the equation of the graph itself labeled. So now with something like this, somebody who's looking at this drawing knows exactly, A, what is it that you graphed? I graphed y equals x squared. They know what these points are supposed to represent. They represent 1, 1 and negative 1, 1. And that I've got my x-axis and my y-axis labeled so that I know which direction is the x-direction and which one is the y-direction. Um, so basically, the expectation here is label everything. The only exception to something being labeled would be this, uh, and that's if you have a point that happens to be on a tick mark, you don't have to label it. So this point here, the point zero, zero, that one doesn't need to be labeled because that one's clearly at zero, zero. But anything that's not on the x-axis or the y-axis at a tick mark I need to see an x and a y coordinate labeled for that point. If you've plotted that point, it needs to be labeled. Okay, so we're going to do an example of graphing a line here. And we're going to do this the way that the question suggests. We're going to first start by finding our slope and our y-intercept. Then we'll use our slope to get two other points in our line, and then we'll graph our equation. So first off, if I want to know the slope and the y-intercept, then that means I need to rewrite this in slope-intercept form, y equals mx plus b. So that's my eventual goal, so I'll start with taking my equation and writing it so that y is on one side by itself. So I'll move the 3x to the other side. Then I'll divide everybody by negative 2. So I can see here that my slope should be 3 halves, and that my y-intercept should be the point 0, negative 3. So we have one point for my graph already, the y-intercept, and now with the slope, we want to use that to find two other points on our line. We know that a slope of three halves means that if we're going two units to the right, that we would be going three units up. So we can use this one point and use it to generate further points by doing that, going two units to the right and three units up. If you're going two units to the right, that's adding two in the x direction, and if you're going three units up, you're adding three in the y direction. So our first point that we have, zero, negative three, to generate the second point, we'll have to go two to the right. So if you were on the x-axis at zero and you went two to the right, you would be at the x-coordinate of two. For the y value, we had a y value of negative three and we're going up by three to give us our new y value of 0. So we know that we should have, in addition to the point 0, negative 3, we should also have the point 2, 0. And we can generate another point by going 2 more to the right. So going from 2 up 2 units to 4, going up by 3, going from 0 up 3 units to positive 3. 
which means I have three points that I can put on my graph. 0, negative 3, 2, 0, and 4, 3. All right, so let's plot those. I already have my x-axis drawn and my y-axis drawn, and you can see they're all nicely labeled already. I've got tick marks already on them. So if I didn't, that would be my first move. But now that I've got my axes ready to go, I'm going to just start by plotting my points. The first point, which was 0, negative 3, I don't have to label that one because that one is at a tick mark on the y-axis. Same thing with my second point, 2, 0. I don't need to label that one either because, again, it's on a tick mark along the x-axis. But my last point that I found, the point 4, 3, that one is not at a tick mark. It's not on the x-axis or the y-axis. So that one I will need to label its coordinates. So I'll label that 4, 3. And so the next thing that I'll do, I'll just draw myself a straight line that goes through those points. And then I just have to finish things off. Um, one thing would be that we should really put an arrow on either head, uh, on either side of the line. The little arrowheads that we have put on there are to show that the line doesn't just stop, that it continues forever in that direction. And same thing with this one. Um, if I didn't put the arrowheads on and if I just stopped right there, there might be a question of does the line terminate at that point? Is this actually just a line segment? Uh, so to show that, yes, the line continues forever, I'll put little arrowheads on them to show that they continue in both directions. And now the one last thing that I need to do, of course, is to label the equation itself. Uh, and the reason for that is if I just showed you this picture and said, that's my graph, you might be wondering, what is it the graph of? What was the equation that you were plotting? And so that's why I should be labeling 3x minus 2y equals 6, labeling my equation of my, uh, labeling the, the graph with its equation. Another good reason why you're going to want to be labeling your equations would be there might be instances where you graph more than one equation on the same x and y axis, in which case you need to be clear which graph is for which equation. And so you'll want to make sure that everything you've graphed, you've well labeled.